Good morning. And good morning, Chicago. Good morning, uh, uh, Washington, D.C. We're so excited to be able to extend the audience today. I want just to, before I begin, on behalf of Ron and Carrie, Al, David, and myself, uh, to give a very special expression of love and appreciation to those of you who are participating with us today. Uh, it is an inexpressible honor to have you be a part of our lives, and we hope that you'll feel that over the next couple of days. Uh, I want to take you back through some of the, uh, the part of our history that you might not be familiar with. I'm going to lay down three threads and try to weave them together in the next 28 minutes. So here we go. First, uh, about 18 years ago, I got a brand new toothbrush. It was one of those electric ones that uh, is about 180 horsepower, uh, oscillates at five million times per second. And I was enjoying it immensely until one evening when after using it, I exited the bathroom and I heard a voice calling out to me in a loving way that said, get back in here. I came back in and my wife was indicating the mirror, which had this beautiful kind of Kandinsky effect on it with uh, spittle all over the place. She said, Joseph, I've asked you before. She said, I, I've asked you just to wipe that down. She said, you seem so attentive to the needs of other people, but when I ask you something, you seem not to pay attention. Well, I defended myself on technical grounds. I, I let her know that it was more about the device than my own bad motives, tried to teach her the six-source model in the moment. She wasn't having any of it. She left in a huff, came back a couple minutes later and said, all right, that probably wasn't the best way for me to bring it up, I'm sorry, but she said, I find it irritating that I have to remind you again and again and again, and again for something as simple as this. Well, at that point, I was not having her apology. I thought that was inappropriately expressed. I deserved more remorse than what she was expressing at the time. So to make a long story somewhat shorter, uh, this ends up at lasting 48 hours, by the way. I decided that night to sleep on the couch. Now, I want you to know that I chose to sleep on the couch. I was doing this to advance her maturing as an adult. I thought that it would be an important life lesson for her. So I lay down there on the couch, kind of smugly thinking that the next morning I would get a well-deserved apology for some of the abuse that I had received the night before. Let's pause that one. December 28, 2009 was probably the most crucial conversation of my life. I'll start 10 months earlier. 10 months earlier, I was at home on a Saturday and there was a knock at the door. When I opened the door, there was a kind of shaggy, worn-looking character standing there. After a couple minutes of staring at him, I recognized something about the eyes and finally clapped him on the shoulders, pulled him in, and I said, Patrick, Patrick, I haven't seen you forever. I dragged him in and sat him down on a chair. Patrick had been one of my scouts about 10 years earlier. He had uh, been part of our little scout group and we'd become fast friends and over a couple years camped together a lot, but after a while he stopped coming. I tried to seek him out, but he seemed to be avoiding me. Finally, one of his friends said, I think Patrick is hanging out with kind of a rough crowd now and I think he's into drugs. Well, that broke my heart. And I continued to try to find him, but finally gave up. So now it's 10 years later. And here he is on my doorstep. I sat him down and I said, Patrick, I said, tell me about what's going on. Well, he told me a story of woe that spanned a decade. Bad decisions, time in jail, time on the street, homelessness. He said, but I've decided I want to turn my life around. And when I started thinking of those I knew that I could trust to help and guide me, he said, you're the only one that came to mind. Everybody else, I think, is part of that other world that I want to leave. I said, I'm so glad you would reach out to me. So we talked for a couple more hours, we created a plan, he'd get a job, he'd start repaying fines, and he'd try to turn his life around. About three months later, he was doing pretty well. He said, you know what, I'm working a minimum wage job, there's this construction job that's a little farther away, if I could buy a car, I'd have transportation, I could do that. So I arranged to co-sign a loan for him, he got this old beater truck, and he began making payments on that, and things were going pretty well, till about August of that, that year. And he disappeared, and it broke my heart. I tried looking for him, I tried calling his cell phone, I tried talking to common friends, and I just, he was not responding at all. So I finally gave up. Now I didn't connect the dots when in October of that year, my house was burglarized. 
And it worried me because I travel a lot, and so I worried about my family's safety in addition to just feeling violated at having somebody penetrate the sanctity of my home. So we went and got a very expensive surveillance system so that we could feel secure as I traveled a lot. It's hard to describe then how it felt in November of that year when our house was burglarized a second time, but this time we had video surveillance data. And as I looked back over that videotape, I saw Patrick enter our backyard, drop down into a window well, kick out one of the windows, and come out minutes later with some of our valuables. I sat there just breathless, watching this, feeling violated and angry, feeling sad and despair, feeling hopelessness for him, and what do you do? Well, I had no contact with him until December 28th of 2009. I was driving not far from our house, and I saw Patrick walking along the road. So I pulled the car over, I rolled down the window, and I said, hey, Patrick, hey, Patrick. The instant he recognized my voice, you could see his body tense, and he was about to spring and run. I said, Patrick, it's okay. I just want to talk. I just want to talk. Third thread. Crucial Conversations for us was a happy accident. So it began like many of your lives uh, in the back of a Volkswagen van. (laughs) <laughs> there were four of us, uh, Al, Kerry, Ron, and myself, kind of talking and dreaming, and we came up with this idea that, that if we could help the world learn to change behavior, we could change the world, that that would be a wonderful way of going about it. So we pulled together, we organized Vital Smarts, and that was 25 years ago last month. It's been a wonderful, wonderful quarter century, and you're an expression of the greatest joy that we have in that work, how many have joined what we think is one of the most important human problems we face. But as we started thinking about how to change the world by changing behavior, one of the questions became, what behavior, if changed, would make the biggest difference? So this is part of the story that's familiar to you. We began with that as the thesis question. Are there a few moments, are there some moments of disproportionate influence where if people behave differently, if you and I could help them pay attention to those brief ephemeral points in time and and help them just slightly modify how they showed up, that we could change their lives, that we could change organizations, that we could change the world. Well, as we began our research looking for those kinds of moments, you're familiar with this moment, but I want to have you play it out anyway. So grab a buddy, grab someone at your table, put your hand on them right now uh, so that everybody knows who's with whom. Get a partner. You got a buddy? All right, very quickly, who's, uh, who's person A? Pick an A and a B. Person A. Person A, let's have a volunteer. Okay, person A, you're going to be Nurse Bonnie. You're the woman in the left. Person B, raise your hand. Person B, okay, you're going to be Dr. Scott. So what I want you to do is just get ourselves into the crucial conversations mode. We're going to play the scene out. As soon as the scene stops, those of you who are Nurse Bonnie, raise your hand again, Nurse Bonnie. That's good. It's half the room. You did it very well. (laughs) It's a smart group, isn't it, Ron? (laughs) So as soon as the video stops, those of you who are Nurse Bonnie, turn to Dr. Scott and just say the next sentence you would say. Here you go. Can I get you to check in on Mr. Gonzalez before you take off? He's the older gentleman who had the punctured lung. We're hoping to release him. I can. I got to get to my son's music assembly. Just, uh, I don't know, just tell him something came up and I'll come back tonight and check on him. Actually, his family's all here expecting to take him home. I told him you were just down the hall. Please, it'll only take a minute. You told him what? I assumed it would be okay. I thought you'd be right in. Oh, you Get thought? Ready. And where did you learn to think? Certainly not some two-year rinky-dink nursing school, that's for sure. All right, go. Where'd you learn to think? Turn and respond. Go. <laughs> all right. Ah, stop wherever you are. So we, we began very quickly to notice that there were moments like that of, of profound emotional complexity. But remember, that's not what we were interested in. So a lot of us that do crucial conversations training think that's why these deserve attention because they're emotionally complex. No, 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 no. That wasn't the thesis question. We wanted to change the world, not just help people feel more comfortable at moments that they're uncomfortable. So we asked, what is it about these moments? So first of all, we found these are moments where something really important to us is on the table. Second, these are moments where we expect others to disagree. 
And finally, those two come together to create this third condition. Now, I want to share some of the backstory because this has been not just an academic and experimental process for Ron Carey, David Allen, myself. It's been very much an action learning process. We've had the crucial conversations along the way. So a number of years back, Carrie and I were working on the chapter of a book, and we had a little process we'd agreed on that I'd take a first write, he'd do rewrites, he'd send it back, and then we'd get on the phone and discuss. So, so we'd done that process. We got together on the phone on a Saturday night, 7 o'clock, and I'd sent the chapter over to him, and he sent it back to me, and so we began the conversation. I said, so Carrie, did you get the chapter? I said, he said, yes. I said, what'd you think? He said, you ruined it. I said, I didn't ruin it, I fixed it. He said, you didn't fix it. He said, it's all disjointed now. It goes from A to E to F. I said, it's not disjointed. I said, it's meaningful now. Now, how long did that conversation take? Did anybody time it? (laughs) It was about eight seconds, yeah. And all that happened that quickly. Now, the irony is, the chapter we were working on was called Master My Stories. (laughs) From a book called Crucial Conversations of All Things. So so we were action learning our way through this, realizing these moments mattered a lot. The big idea that started to emerge from our work is that you can measure the health of a relationship, the health of a team, even the health of an entire organization by measuring the average lag time between identifying and discussing problems. That's what began to emerge from our research. And we began looking at ourselves from that same perspective. What about our relationships? What about our marriages? What about our families, our organization? What's the average lag time between identifying a problem, feeling it, and it getting on the table in a healthy way? To put it graphically, it looks kind of like this. So we all kind of walk along through life and we all have our white Volkswagen van moment when we have this super awesome goal that we decide to go after. So we start marching happily towards it. Inevitably, on that march, we encounter these moments. Why? Because there's something by definition of high stakes on the table. The instant you have a super awesome goal, by definition, there will be moments where the stakes are high, where people disagree, and then it becomes an emotional, visceral process. Ladies and gentlemen, what we've learned is that the best way to minimize the number of crucial conversations you have in life is to have a meaningless life. (laughs) As soon as you go after something important, they will occur. Now, you're familiar with this important research. Any of you seen this before? Well, let's, uh, let's enjoy the moment for a second. I want to give you a backstory for it as well. So as we were doing our research, my son Samuel had a science fair project due, and uh, he said he wanted to study how little kids deal with crucial conversations. I was not particularly encouraging. I said, I said Samuel, I think little kids don't have the same kind of social constraints that adults do. And yet look what he found. We all know adults stink at talking about tough things, but how about little kids? Here's my experiment. Feed kids wretched brownies, then see if they'll tell you the truth, especially when they think it might hurt your feelings. First I made the brownies. Lots of chocolate, eggs and flour, but instead of sugar, I put in salt. Lots of salt. There's no way they could like these better. Now I recruit kids of various ages for a taste test. I tell them I want to compare ordinary brownies to my special brownies. My dear grandmother's special recipe. My dear dead grandmother's special recipe. Then I give them a dollar for being such a big help. My parents always taught me that if you want someone to like you, give them money. Okay, here goes. First they ate the yummy sugar brownies. Next, they eat the salt bricks. Watch this girl. She can hardly keep from gagging. And now for the crucial moment. Will they tell me the truth and possibly offend me? I asked them to point to the brownies they like best. No surprise that some tried to spare my feelings. 
But watch, even the one who gagged? And how about really little kids? But do you want to know what they really thought? Here guys, I have leftovers. Does anybody want seconds? Isn't that astounding? I was just absolutely blown away. Now the backstory is that little girl whose face puckered up, her name is Hannah. She lives right next door to us and she is one of the most blunt, honest, outspoken little kids in the world. But she's lying about the brownies. It blew my mind to see how one after another these kids who with absolutely no other agenda were coming in and, and lying about how they really felt. So, so what staggered me in that moment and the words that sort of came to me was at what a remarkably young age you and I start to draw a damnable conclusion. It turns out that at about age three or four, you and I start to believe that you frequently have to choose between telling the truth and keeping a friend. And that one belief causes mischief for the rest of our lives. That's the controlling assumption that dictates how we show up in interpersonal situations from that moment forward. And that's why these moments of disproportionate influence have such an enormous effect. David Chase and I did a research project a few months back. We asked people across the world, if you had a magic wand, if you had a magic wand that would eliminate consequences for just one conversation, so you have a permission now to say one thing, anything you want to anybody you want, and there will be no consequences. Who would you say it to and what would it be? I want you to look at some of the responses and speculate for a moment with me about the consequences of these moments of disproportionate influence. So here was one. To my boss, for eight years you single-handedly drove away every good employee we've ever had. I can no longer tolerate your condescending tone, your passive micromanaging, your overt verbal sexual harassment towards female employees, your hypocritical management or work time, or even your insincere compliments. Affectionately, <laughs> moi. <laughs> now here's what I want you to think about. What is the cost or consequence of keeping that in a vault? And how is it showing up today? That's what we began to notice. Second, to my wife. We've been together a long time, but it's time for us to consider going our separate ways. Ladies and gentlemen, so many broken relationships are not broken because it was inevitable, it, they were broken by silence. They were broken because the lag time between feeling a problem and discussing the problem in a healthy way yawned so wide that the relationship broke. To my supervisor. <laughs> Now, now let me ask you the question, what does silence look like in that case? Is silence truly silent or is it showing up? To my colleague, I betrayed your trust by sharing confidential information that you shared with me with another peer, I apologize, I'd change it if I could. How does guilt show up when it's undiscussed? To the woman next to me, do you have a cat or something that marks your coat, shoes, or bags? There's a really bad odor from you in your desk, it's very nauseating and offensive to me. Now, now that's a sensitive issue to put on the table, but let's ask ourselves, what is the cost of silence and how is it showing up? The principle that we found over time, the reason these moments have such disproportionate influence is because you and I don't get to vote on how they affect relationships. If you don't talk it out, what do you do? You act it out. We know that. It shows up in a hundred different ways. You sleep on the couch at night and you imagine someone suffering upstairs. If it's not getting discussed, it's getting acted out. It shows up in your behavior like this. Whenever I get mad at you, you never seem to get upset. How do you manage to control your temper? I just go and clean the toilet, she says. Well, how does that help? I use your toothbrush. <laughs> to my husband. I feel frustrated by the mess and clutter in our house. I love you, but I can't stand this anymore. I've been patient for a long time. It appears you don't care. In addition, I think you need professional help to deal with hoarding tendencies. I want to get some counseling, and I think you should too. Now, now I ask us to contemplate for a moment. Is silence truly silent? You know, or is it showing up somewhere? Finally, what if, what if you were the boss and you're carrying this in your vault? Find a different job now. While I can't prove it, I know that you stir up trouble between your coworkers, you don't pay attention to your job, you lack respect for anyone, you take no responsibility for actions and blame others. What you and I are trying to do in teaching crucial conversations 
at least at the very basic level, is simply this. One simple concept that can dramatically change how people show up in crucial moments is just to read the title of the book. Because it causes us to do this, to start for once calculating the costs of silence, for once realizing silence isn't truly silent, to just carefully and thoughtfully list what are the costs right now How is it showing up? And what is the default future if this continues to go undiscussed? That's what you and I are doing in the world. What we're trying to help people do is take a more mental, conscious calculus of the real costs of the decisions they're currently making. What you and I know is that crucial conversations aren't just a pit. They aren't just a problem to get over. They actually have the potential of becoming one of the accelerants of intimacy. Crucial conversations well held accelerate the building of trust between individuals. They not only don't damage it, they actually create a sense of connection with people that can't come most any other way. And yet, here's how we continue to look at them. The contribution you and I are trying to make to the world is to help them understand that it's the pathway to the super awesome goal, not just something that keeps us from it. So the first big idea that we came across was this, the vital behavior that enables most any organizational outcome is just candor, it's just showing up in those moments. And you've seen the research across so many different domains. You and I are saving lives, we're saving relationships, we're reconnecting families, we're building teams and organizations just by getting to look at that one moment a little bit differently. This has mattered to Vital Smarts as well. I remember the moment that I believed we could make it as a company. It's because after the Crucial Conversations book came out, there was a moment at which Yan Wang, our CFO, who comes from a tradition and background that does not encourage candor with people in positions of authority. It took immense effort for her to approach Al Switzler and say to him, you know Al, you've been taking books along on all of the book tour things and selling them at the back of the room to try to help promote things and that's really well and good. But when you come back with a whole bunch of written credit card numbers and checks, it takes more time for us to process those than it's worth for the money. Perhaps you ought to just give the books away. After she finished that feedback to Al, it looked like she wanted to throw up. That was, that was challenging, it was terrifying for her, and none of us could have been prouder of her. She set a tone for Vital Smarts. She helped us turn the corner and start becoming that kind of organization. We don't always show up perfectly, but we try hard because we know these moments are our lifeblood as well. So what you and I are trying to fix is that dynamic. Now the last piece I wanna do is just tie together a couple of those other threads. So it's December 28th, 2009. And I rolled down the window, and I said, Patrick, would you just get in the car? After a couple minutes, he looked defeated, but he got in the car. We drove back to our house, and I walked him down to the basement, and I sat him in front of a television screen. I put a videotape in, and I prepared to push play, but I said, Patrick, before I show you this, I said, I need to to ask you a question. He was looking at the ground, just absolutely mortified in this moment. I said, Patrick, would you, would you look me in the eye for just a moment because I need to know that you hear me. So he finally, with great effort, locked on my eyes. And I said, Patrick, do you know that I love you? His eyes welled up with tears instantly. He said, yes, I do. I said, Patrick, do you know that I would never do anything if I didn't think it was in your best interests? His shoulders started to to heave and convulse. And he said, yes, I do. I said, good. Then I need you to look at something. And I just played the security footage, at which point he started heaving and convulsing openly, sobbing. He said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I said, Patrick, I understand. But I need you to understand that I don't think I would be your friend if I didn't let you be held accountable for what you did to me and what you did to my family. I've turned this over to the police and I know they'd like to talk with you, but that's your choice. It's up to you whether you make contact with them or not. What penetrated my soul was that his response, rather than defensiveness and rather than attack, was to say, I know I need to go to jail, but will you be there for me when I get out? 
And through my own tears, I said, Patrick, I will always be here for you. What we've learned along the way as Al, Carrie, Ron, David, and myself have gone through our own crucial conversations is that you don't have to choose between telling the truth and keeping a friend. It turns out that if people feel safe, you can speak truth. They may not like it. They may not enjoy it. It may cause pain and suffering for them, but at least they'll be able to hear it. The second gift you and I are trying to give to the world, in addition to noticing that these moments require a different kind of risk calculus than we've been doing throughout history, the second thing we're trying to help them do is to, to transcend that horrible dichotomy that they've been carrying since they were three years old. To for once realize that the problem is not the choice between telling the truth and keeping the friend, the problem is trying to figure out how to do both. And if all you and I ever do in our training is just help people to reframe the question, to say how could I show up in this moment in a way that's absolutely honest and absolutely respectful, we will have done our job and we will have changed lives and we will have changed organizations. Candor isn't the problem. The problem is a lack of safety. And you and I are helping the world to understand that if you can create a context of safety in the Middle East, in war-torn countries, in the US, in divided cities, if you and I can help people just understand that if you can create a safe place to get honesty in the open, that, that intimacy accelerates, that connection is possible, then we will have done our jobs. So I'm laying down on the couch. <laughs> and I'm imagining how the next morning I'll get this well-deserved apology, but I didn't. Instead, we went to this plastic kind of fake civility routine, and the kids who were, there were sitting around and having breakfast, and, and I'm sort of pulling her chair out, and she's getting me the milk, and we're both acting polite like we kind of moved on past the moment. And that kind of disconnected insincerity went on all day long until that night. And I decided the best way to advance her education would be to sleep with her that night, and so I went in, I used the toothbrush, I wiped down the mirror, made sure she saw me doing it, and very self-righteously got in bed, she finished her bathroom stuff, she got in bed, both of us respected the DMZ sitting there in between us, and she said, good night, honey, I said, good night, honey, she clicked off the light, and I lay down there, and I thought to myself, my goal is to go to sleep faster than her, because then she'll be writhing in agony and realizing I've moved on and then she'll probably look at herself and her fallen ways and apologize. So, so I'm laying there kind of psyching myself into relaxation when I hear this <laughs> And I'm telling you, you know, this is, I've, I've grown a little bit emotionally since then but I still identify with the feelings. I felt this white hot rage shoot through my body. I'm laying there thinking, you don't even realize how much you've mistreated me, do you? I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, to myself, how did I end up with her, right? <laughs> and I'm going over and over in my mind all the wrongs and, and how mistreated I am in this relationship when, when after a while I looked over at the clock and it had been like two hours and the moon finally comes down through the window and bathes her hideous face <laughs> in its glow. And I literally looked at her and just, I couldn't imagine one redeeming quality this woman had. And as this kind of feeling is surging through me, finally this, this thought comes galloping towards me from off at the distance. And I saw it coming, recognized it, tried to dodge it. But it finally snuck around the other side, went into my ear, and, and the question was, what am I acting like I want? And what do I really want? And you know what? As soon as I relaxed into that question, that fast, this picture came into my mind. And the picture was when I'd come home from a trip earlier that week, I walked in, and she just looked over at me and smiled. And I felt connected, and I felt home, and I felt loved. And I surrendered to that. And I said, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want. And you know what? I looked over at her, and she looked entirely different. She was beautiful. And I could remember everything that made me love her and I slipped into slumber. And the next morning, ah, 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 the alarm goes off and I woke up, but the sun looked brighter that day. And I looked over at her, but you could see the instant she remembered the mode we were in the night before because her shoulders stiffened and she slid off the bed and she walked over and went to go into the bathroom. And I said, Sila, I'm sorry. I said, I wasted the last 48 hours and I wish I could have them back. She said, I'm sorry, and, and I want to hear everything that's on your mind and concerning you whenever you'd like to talk. 
she paused for just a moment, and I could see when it sort of got absorbed in her too because her shoulders dropped about two inches. She turned around, sat on the edge of the bed, and we talked. It turns out that the way you see others during those crucial moments is less a reflection of who they are and more of a reflection of what we want. When our motives are bad, we can't even see people for what they are. What you and I know is that all it takes to get truth on the table is just a little bit of safety. It's just an apology. It's just a smile. It's just a hug. It's just taking something back. It takes very little, but people aren't willing to do it if they don't realize that you can transcend that false trade-off between telling the truth and keeping a friend. It is immensely gratifying to be part of this work with you. We hope you feel of our love and support for you. These are the big ideas that we're trying to take out into the world. When, when we were in the white Volkswagen van, you were just a gleam in our eye. <laughs> but we're glad you're now part of the family. Thank you very much.